Hey everyone, my name is Diana Chan Morgan and I work at deeplearning.ai running all things community. Today we have an amazing workshop uh, with some of our course partners to bring together uh, what's next for LLM agents. So today we're working with Llama Index and TrueEra and they will guide you through the entire process of building, evaluating, iterating, and deploying successful LLM agents. Uh, this session will be recorded and the slides will be sent afterwards. We also have a notebook that our speakers were so kind enough to share. So we will drop that in the chat for you to be, be able to access and follow along during the session. This workshop utilizes cutting edge open source tools like Llama Index, a simple and flexible data framework for connecting custom data sources to large language models, and TrueLens, a powerful platform for testing and tracking LLM app experiments. In this session, you'll be able to gain valuable insights into building your first LLM agent, effectiveness, hallucinations and bias, iterating for production ready applications, and maintaining high performance in production. For any questions for the speakers, we've also dropped a link in the chat to ask and vote upon the questions that we will answer in the last five to 10 minutes of the workshop today. This workshop was also inspired by our newest short course that was just launched last week. It's called Building and Evaluating Advanced RAG Applications. I'm sure our speakers will talk a little bit more about it today. Uh, you can find that on our website and we'll also be setting that out afterwards and you can find it um, in the link in the chat as well. And to start off with, I wanna share our first speaker. We have Jerry. Jerry Leo is the CEO of Llama Index. He brings a wealth of experience from his previous roles as an ML engineering manager, as a robust intelligence and research scientist at Uber. Hey, Jerry, really happy to have you here today. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. And next we have Anupam. Anupam is the president and chief scientist at Truera and is a renowned AI expert and former professor at Carnegie Mellon University. His research, his research focuses on ensuring accountability and fairness in AI systems. We're so happy to have you here today, Anupam. Great to be here, Diana. Absolutely. Well. I'll let you guys take it away for the workshop. I know you have a lot of stuff planned, so uh, I think our community is ready to dive into everything. Awesome. Perfect. I'll let you guys take it away. Awesome. Uh, the slides are visible. Yep. Great. So let's get started. Today's workshop is about how to build, evaluate, and iterate on LLM agents. Like Deanna said, Jerry and I just recorded a course and released it on deeplearning.ai, which focuses on RAG-based applications. You can think of this as a continuation of that, but expanding into agents. And later on, Jerry will comment more on the technical connection between the two. Uh, between the two. So just to orient ourselves, we'll take a few minutes to look at some examples of frameworks and actual agent-based LLM apps that are starting to get quite a bit of adoption. So ChatGPT put out their plugins some time back, as many of you are aware. And with these plugins or LLM agents, you can augment ChatGPT to access up-to-date information, run computations, or use third-party services. When we share the slides later, these are hot links so you can explore them. These are some of the examples of applications that the first set of applications that were currently available. You can see that these agents, like on Instacart, you can order. So these agents can start planning for you. They can start acting on your behalf and order things like grocery and help you plan for trips and so on, or even do math. So that's one set of applications. There were a couple of other very early seminal work in this area. One is this very interesting result in paper called React, which combines reasoning and acting with large language models. This has been a very influential paper in the space of agents. Before that, thinking around reasoning, like chain of thought reasoning, where an LLM might when it's asked a question, reason through the answer first and then provide the answer, which is very widely used, reasoning was separated from acting, where you can go out and the LLM can be used to act on the environment and act on your behalf for various tasks like planning your travel reservations or making restaurant reservations and so on. With React, these two bodies of work were pulled together where there was an interleaving of reasoning and actions 
And that really significantly increased the power of agent-based LLM apps. And let me give you a very quick example. And this is taken from the React, uh, from the React paper. So the question that was asked here is, aside from the Apple remote, what other device can control the program Apple remote was originally designed to interact with? And if you just ask a standard LLM, then the answer was iPod, which was incorrect. If you get, if you make the LLM think through reason step by step, even then it comes back with the wrong answer. If it only acts, then it starts doing an external search, but the search does not produce a meaningful result. So this on the left here is standard reasoning and, act, and, and a separation between reasoning and acting when you do one at a time, but not interleaving, that does not produce the right result. On the right here, you can see how where thinking and actions are interleaved, you suddenly start seeing a much better result. So the thinking here was, well, I need to search for the Apple remote. So it invokes a search API to do the search, the search comes back with this front row media center as uh, a keyword. The second thinking now is we need to go search for front row. The first search for front row does not give anything very concrete, but suggests that you might want to look at some similar things, which are which includes the software. So the next layer of thinking does results in the action being searched for front row software. Eventually, it results in finding the right answer, which is you can also control these devices with keyboard function keys. The details of this example is not so important, but the main thing is this interleaving of reasoning or thinking with actions. And this back and forth really is where a lot of the power of LLM-based agents derive from. So I encourage you to take a look at this set of results, the React paper, the GitHub to get a sense of the history of one of the important developments um, that spurred the recent excitement about agents. The other project that I'll point you to is AutoGPD. AutoGPD came out some time back, and it was one of the fastest growing uh, open source projects on GitHub. You can see it's this is a relatively recent screenshot. It has about 150 plus, 150K plus stars. Uh, and then this hackathon, which was recently done uh, in October, uh, has lots of examples of interesting LLM-based applications that you can explore. Um, so for example, um, you, there are some, some interesting things around coding and so on. Now, as people started diving into agent-based applications, there are some limitations that started emerging as well some failure modes. Often this includes augmenting LLMs with additional tools over APIs uh, to do search, to look for travel itineraries, to look for uh, restaurant reservations, and so on. And as you start increasing the number of tools, the LLM has to reason based on a query, what tool is the right tool to use as part of creating the answer. And that's where mistakes happen. That's a common failure mode. There can be infinite loops. There's also hallucinations, a problem that is known very common with large language models uh, appears also in this context. And we'll talk about these in a minute. So as we think about the space of AI agents, uh, we think about it in this kind of three stages. There's specialized data agents, which are quite similar to retrieval from a vector store and the retrieval augmented or RAG kind of architecture, but with access to real-time information and some additional pieces. There's general data agents that have access to more than one tool and can accomplish a wider range of tasks. And then there are agents that can take action in the real world. So we'll, we'll focus quite a bit on data agents in this talk. And in that context, we will make use, introduce you to how to work with, how to build agents, data agents with Llama index, and, and to evaluate it systematically, understand the failure modes, iterate and improve it by leveraging TrueLens. So these are our GitHubs. Please feel free to uh, explore them. Many of you are already there uh, playing with Llama index and with TrueLens. 
uh, and uh, you know our developers uh, enjoy it when when you request features, make contributions. Uh, please give us stars as well if if you like what you see there. With that, I'm going to transition it over to Jerry. Jerry will talk about how to build LLM agents with Llama Index. Jerry. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Alibam. Um, and so uh, maybe taking a really quick pivot right here, uh, we're kind of featuring our course that just came out last week, uh, building and evaluating advanced RAG applications. Uh, and so the course itself is focused a little bit more on advanced RAG techniques, uh, retrieval augmented generation. Uh, for those of you who might be less familiar with RAG, RAG is basically just a technique for augmenting your LLM with an external knowledge corpus. Uh, and so the way it works is you first, you know, do retrieval or index uh, your data into a storage system. Then you do retrieval from the storage system on query time and, and then add that context to the prompt window of the LLM. And so there's both like a simple way of doing that. Um, but these days, a lot of developers are excited about exploring advanced ways to do that and to do uh, to try out advanced methods. You also need a rigorous system to do evaluations on both the retrieval and generation piece. Um, and so we were, we were really excited to work with Truera on this course uh, because, you know, TrueLens has a robust evaluation suite. Uh, Llama Index has invested a lot in advanced retrieval techniques. And so we combine them together into this overall short course. Um, and so you should definitely check it out. And this also serves as a nice bridge into how we think about how agents evolve from RAG, basically, right? Like what there, there's kind of these two buzzwords floating around. There's RAG and then there's agents. And so how do we really think about um, the transition between RAG and, and agents? Um, and so the way RAG works, right? We can kind of think about it as a box. Uh, the user has a question, like a query. Um, RAG is this overall pipeline defined over your knowledge corpus. Uh, and within this overall uh, kind of RAG box, we'll do retrieval from the knowledge corpus as well as synthesis. Uh, and, and after that, we get back a final response. One of the ways we think about agents, uh, next slide, is Basically, we uh, can think about that as an additional layer um, in front of the RAG uh, pipeline. Um, and, and what this, well, how we think about this is basically given a user query, um, we can actually uh, feed it to an overall agent that can more dynamically decide um, how to uh, you know, uh, route this query through to relevant tools to try to synthesize the response. And so in a traditional RAG setup, what typically happens is that, you know, the LLM, uh, the LLM call occurs at the end of this overall pipeline. You do retrieval, which is typically like, you know, top K embedding lookup, uh, and then you feed it to the language model at the end. But here, the idea is what if we actually use the LLM uh, at the beginning as well, you know, to actually take in the query and figure out how to actually make use of the underlying tools whether it is a RAG pipeline, an external API call, or some other service. So we kind of think about agents as wrapping a layer on top of RAG that dynamically enriches the query with additional information and basically allows this overall kind of uh, higher level abstraction to use tools in the right way to try to give you back a response. Uh, in the next few slides, we'll go into a little bit more about the architecture of how, how this works as well. So a few months ago, uh, we defined this concept of data agents within Llama Index, which are LLM-powered knowledge workers. Um, a data agent uh, is basically something that is designed to help you automate knowledge uh, and can both do search and retrieval, as well as synthesis, uh, as well as modify data. So uh, for, an ex for example, a sample flow is given in this slide right here. Um, given a data agent, uh, you can, for instance, make a call to read the latest emails that you have. Uh, for instance, from Gmail or from some external service. Uh, afterwards, you could also retrieve additional context for your knowledge base. Um, this is a perfect example of the RAG pipeline as a tool within an agent. So this uh, by itself could be a RAG tool. Um, you could have an analysis agent that actually analyzes the file, for instance, using a tool like Code Interpreter or, or another RAG pipeline. Um, and then you could have another uh, tool where by actually calling it, you are taking actions and, and modifying state. And so in this case, you send an update to a third party service like Slack, uh, and that actually you know, triggers a, a message to be written um, to this service. Next slide. 
the way we think about agents is the core components are really one, an agent reasoning loop, um, which Anupam covered a little bit in terms of like a React loop, uh, as well as tools, right? And, and so the, the, the way it works is the agent reasoning loop typically operates over the set of tools that you give uh, to this agent. Uh, the agent reasoning loop is typically powered by a large language model because that allows it to be basically dynamically decide, you know, for instance, what are the next tools I should use given the user input uh, to try to call, to try to, you know, um, synthesize uh, the right results. The tools themselves can be, for instance, uh, the, what we call query engine tools like RAG pipelines. Um, so you get to basically take all the techniques you learned in the short course that we just find and plug them in as RAG tools to this overall agent. We also have a variety of different tools on Llama Hub that connect to third-party services. Um, we have over 20 to 25 tools on Llama Hub. This includes um, uh, API uh, interfaces to, for instance, Slack, Notion, uh, Zapier, or the Code Interpreter. And all these tools basically act as API interfaces uh, to uh, specifically designed for LM agents. And so you can actually mix and match, for instance, like your RAG agent tools, as well as your Llama Hub tools and basically combine them um, into this overall uh, agent that can both do search and retrieval as well as take actions on different services. Uh, I think Anupam covered what React is uh, in the previous few slides. There's also, of course, a few other ways to actually perform agent reasoning. Um, one way is you can just do a function calling loop uh, over the OpenAI agent. Uh, for instance, like under the hood, I think the API service will just handle for you and decide uh, you know, what, what are the functions that you should call given the inputs that you give it. There's also other algorithms like tree of thought, uh, plan and, and execute, um, and a few others. Uh, you know, there's there's a few papers coming out of these conferences every year. Uh, next slide. Maybe a quick comment here is how do you actually do um, search or retrieval from a knowledge base, right? And and this touches on this point about basically plugging in a rag pipeline as a tool within this overall agent. Um, one idea here is. Um, kind of elaborating uh, on this a little bit, uh, Llama Index, basically, you know, um, the, the, the TLDR is we have a bunch of these things called query engines, which are basically, for all intents and purposes, generalizations of RAG pipelines. They take in a, a user query and they give you back uh, a response. Um, and so what you can do is, you know, we have a bunch of these query engines. We have uh, semantic search, which is basically a RAG pipeline. Um, we have summarization, which is uh, you return all the context and you try to synthesize an answer over all the context instead of just the top K. We have query engines over structured data, um, uh, for instance, like text to SQL over uh, a SQL database. We also have uh, advanced RAG pipelines, um, some of which you actually learn in the short course. Um, this enables you to do stuff like document comparisons, as well as being able to do, uh, do kind of like uh, combined querying over hybrid structured data with unstructured data. The way the Llama Index architecture works is you can actually just plug in all these query engines as tools to an agent. Um, and so you have basically have this outer agent layer, right, which acts as a reasoning loop. Um, and if it calls a tool, then the tool executes, which is a query engine. Um, and so this basically gives you the ability to compose uh, kind of more advanced reasoning um, abstractions and, and layers on top of your data. Um, so that you basically first have this agent handle the user query, decide what tools to call, and then execute the tools. There's a variety of examples that we have in the notebooks of what this allows. This basically allows you to answer more complex queries, allows you to do a little bit of query planning to try to execute some things in parallel, allows you to dynamically do both stuff like semantic search and summarization, um, as well as text to SQL, as well as combine information from disparate data sources. Next slide. Um, an example here, right? Um, and yeah, uh, basically from, from the screenshot is we have this kind of uh, example agent, uh, for instance, and let's say we plugged in two query tools, one for Uber and one for Lyft. And each query tool is just a rag pipeline over uh, each company's uh, annual report, like the 10K filing. So each uh, tool corresponds to you know a top K rag pipeline over that company. You plug both tools into this agent. And now you can ask a question like, compare and contrast Uber and Lyft's revenue growth. Um, the agent uh, through its reasoning loop and chain of thought process and, and React reasoning will break down the question into sub questions over the tool. Um, and then each uh, question, uh, sub question plus tool will be executed, right? Uh, each tool will be executed with that sub question. 
And within each sub question, we'll do per document rag. So first we'll look at Uber's revenue growth, uh, look at the Uber tool, do top K rag, get back the answer. Then look at Lyft's revenue growth, do top K rag, get back the answer and combine the results at the end. So this is just a concrete example. Next slide. In, in the next two slides, we'll kind of talk about just some general architecture decisions um, for how do you think about um, modeling some of these agents. Uh, and in the slides after that, AutoHub goes into uh, detail about you know, a lot of the failure modes as well as how you actually evaluate these agents. But just some general things to think about is, one is how do you actually handle large responses from tools? Like if a tool resp uh, returns like an entire essay or an, like a very large web page, how do you actually handle that? Um, one str some strategies that we basically have, uh, and you know, we call them like on-demand loader tool as well as load and search tool, basically involve um, on the fly indexing of this data. Sometimes it's nice to first load this data and actually index it into vector storage. Uh, so that you, when you actually kind of query this data that you loaded from the tool, you actually do search and retrieval over it instead of trying to stuff everything into the context window. Even though context windows are getting bitter, uh, bigger, like they still overflow on large amounts of data. And so this is uh, like indexing it beforehand is a way to mitigate that. Next slide. Another problem um, that I think AudioPalm also touched on is uh, a lot of these agents tend to struggle a little bit when you overload them with tools. Um, and so if, for instance, you have more than like five tools uh, and, and you know, in, in the limit, you might have like hundreds, thousands, even millions of tools. Uh, at a certain point, this isn't gonna fit into your context window. So what you can actually do is you could try to actually index the tools themselves, right? Index the metadata of the tools. And then during, um, basically during query time, you actually first do search and retrieval over the relevant tools uh, first and then uh, pass that to your agent uh, to then ask the question. So these are just some general considerations and we'll do a section at the end as well, uh, kind of talking about some best practices for constructing agents. Uh, but hopefully this gives you a general overview uh, and passing it back to Anupam. Great. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jerry. And now you have gotten a good sense of some of the key building blocks for how to build agents and especially how to do it with Llama Index, where Jerry and team have driven a lot of the early work in this space. We'll shift gears a bit and start looking at evaluation and what are some of the failure modes of agents and how do you detect those kinds of issues? How do you iterate to improve them? So I'll do a quick introduction to TrueLens in this context. TrueLens is an open source library to track and evaluate your LLM experiments as you're building your applications in Llama Index, uh, for example, or any other Python framework. You can use TrueLens uh, fairly easily in, as part of that application building process. Uh, and we'll show you a notebook, and Diana is also sharing it. Uh, so you'll have access to the notebook on GitHub to play with yourself. So as you're building your LLM application with, say, Llama Index, with just a few lines of code, you can connect TrueLens to it. You can start logging the records, the prompts, the responses, the intermediate results, the entire call, call trace. And interestingly, then what you can do is we have this nice abstraction of what we call feedback functions or evaluations which lets you log and evaluate the quality of your LLM applications along a number of different dimensions. And once you have those set up, a number of these are available out of the box. You can add your own evaluations as well very easily. Uh, you can start exploring these records, evaluation results uh, in a true lens dashboard, see what the failure modes are, and that can in turn inform iteration selection of the best LLM application version for your uh, for your use case. So let's let's look at uh, a concrete use case where we may want to use the kind of data agents that Jerry introduced for real time retrieval, calling out to external APIs and tools. So the user comes in here with an input, a query, and then the LLM acts as the reasoning agent. It picks a tool, one from a set of tools that might be available from it. It translates the user query into a, an input that is appropriate for the tool. 
gets back the output from the tool, and then produces the final response. In this process, what are some agent failure modes? It might The agent might, in this reasoning step, pick the wrong tool. If it's a question about restaurants, instead of putting Yelp, it might, if it picks something like archive and it gives you a research paper on which makes, which talks about restaurant recommendations, um, that would not be very appropriate. But that kind of mistakes in picking the right tool is pretty common. It's a common failure mode for agents, especially as the number of tools start going up. Um, it can get stuck in infinite loops, um, especially because many of these agents, the base, base case ones are, don't have carry state. Um, API calls might fail, say they, if the input is not formatted, if the query translation is not done in the right format, you might have um, also other kinds of failure modes related to hallucinations. So let me talk about a very concrete use case now. And this is what is available in the notebook that is made available to you. We'll talk about a restaurant information chatbot where the user starts asking some questions. And then the agent is makes use of the Yelp API, so one tool in this case, to answer questions related to it. And we'll compare that with a baseline where the LLM is just answering these questions based on its pre-trained knowledge and without access to a, uh, to, a, to an external API. So those are the two that we will compare. Um, this is available in this, uh, in this notebook. Here is a QR code. You can play with it uh, after the session if you like. Uh, it'll also be shared with you. It's available publicly on GitHub. To make things interesting, we instructed the agent to respond in the style of Gordon Ramsay when asked questions about um, restaurant recommendations. Let me just show you a couple of examples here. So the first question that we asked was, uh, what is the best restaurant in Toronto, or the best diner in Toronto? And this was to the just to the OpenAI LLM, not without access to without access to the Yelp reviews. And this is the answer came back with. Uh, I'll take you a second to read it. Remember that the prompt was to respond in the style of Gordon Ramsay. And so there you can see that it's not necessarily particularly respectful. We asked the same question of the LLM agent, which had access to the Yelp APIs. And then the response came back. Uh, this is the response that came back. Um, this is a bit more polite, maybe because he there was an answer that was actually retrieved, which the LLM was then asked to summarize. So now we have a couple of these answers, and we want to be able to think through and have tooling to do evaluations. So let me circle back and start talking about a framework for evaluations of LLM agents. So before we go into LLM agents, I want to recap one slide from our deeplearning.ai course on advanced RAG techniques that Jerry and I recently launched, um, which you should take a look at. It's just one hour. Um, in that, we talk about the RAG triad for guarding against hallucinations. So if you think of a RAG, the user comes in with a query, much like in this example, what's the best diner in Toronto? Based on that query, a set of contexts or chunks are retrieved from a vector database, and then those then get summarized by an LLM to produce the final response. And along each edge of this triangle, there is a property that you want to test for. On the first edge, there's a property that we call context relevance, which is check if the retrieved pieces of context were relevant to the query that was asked. 
On the second edge, there's groundedness. Groundedness is checking, is the final response supported by the context? And then finally, with answer relevance, we are checking, is the final response relevant to the query that was asked? So this is the RAG triad. And in, in the deeplearning.ai course, we discuss how to implement these kinds of evaluations uh, within TrueLens programmatically, automatically, and you can make use of them out of the box. Now, once we transition from rags to agents, where things get a little more uh, sophisticated is this first step that Jerry was talking about. You, much like Jerry said, for especially for data agents, you can think of that initial reasoning step of the agent as a layer of abstraction over a rag. So the rag triad becomes the agent quad. When the user asks a query, then there is a tool selection step, which needs to be evaluated as well, which is done by the, executed by the agent. And that involves both picking the right tool as well as translating the original user query into a query that is in the right format for the tool that was selected. And then once that is done, the next few steps are similar to what you would do for a RAG-based application. You want to check for context relevance. You want to check for groundedness. And you want to check for answer relevance. And what I'll do next is to just give you some concrete examples of how this plays out when we work with the uh, example of the LLM agent that's making use of the Yelp API. And then we will, Jerry and I will tag team and share with you a bit of the flow, the code in the notebook that makes it all real. So in this first step here for this particular example, because there's only one tool, which is the Yelp API, tool selection simply reduces to query translation. And this was the original question uh, that was asked, what's the address of Gumbo Social in San Francisco? And the LLM agent translated it into this question for the Yelp API, address of Gumbo Social in San Francisco. And the automated evaluation that is available in TrueLens checks for semantic equivalence between these two, between these two um, questions, leveraging LLMs. So some of the some of the evaluations that are available in TrueLens make use of large language models as part of the evaluation process. There are also other ways of doing evaluations that make use of standard NLP metrics as well as uh, smaller models uh, that, that offer some trade-offs between effectiveness and scalability. If you look at this example, it's a nice example. The question, the LLM agent does a good job of translating the original question into the kind of keywords that work with the Yelp API. And the evaluation gives it a high score on a scale of 0 to 1. It's 1, meaning that it did a good job of query translation. Next, we look at the second step in the squad, which is context relevance. So <clears throat> we get back this answer from the API. And now we are asking, is this answer relevant to the question that was asked? And this also works well. Context relevance does well here. The answer is quite relevant to the question that was asked. And so that gets a high score as well. The third test is around groundedness. Groundedness is looking at whether the final response is grounded in the set of retrieved context. In this case, the final response very closely follows the, this is the final response. The address of Gumbo Social in San Francisco is this particular address. And the retrieved context was just the address itself. So the final response that's provided by the LLM is well supported by the evidence in the context that was retrieved in this case from the Yelp API. So it gets a high score. So in general, these steps could fail. 
it could be that the LLM hallucinates and makes some stuff up, and it produces a final state sentence or response, which is not backed up by the retrieved information from the Yelp API. In this example, it does rely on that exclusively, and so it, the groundedness score is high. So here's an example where the groundedness score is not as high. So this was the uh, Toronto diner example. So you can see that uh, there are a few sentences here in the final response. The first sentence uh, talks about the best diner in Toronto is subjective and can vary depending on personal preferences. And the supporting evidence for that is this is what was retrieved from the Yelp API. It is difficult to determine the best diner in Toronto without prior knowledge. However, based on the context information provided, here are some of the diners worth considering. Over here, this is again well supported. It's talking about there's not a unique answer to this question of best diner in Toronto. But then the LLM here injected in a bit of additional things, its own opinion. You can, I recommend you try them out and decide for yourself. And then it also snuck this in, just to make sure to have low expectations as most diners in Toronto are mediocre at best. So this last sentence over here, uh, perhaps the LLM is responding to being prompted to act like Gordon Ramsay. I just can't get away from it. So that that is not well supported by the retrieved information. The, the retrieve context, and so you can see that it has a low score. So in general, the groundedness evaluation is super powerful in identifying areas where the agent makes stuff up and, and engages in hallucinations. And then this finally, uh, so here's another example. This is from New York. Uh, maybe I'll skip this example, but if you take a look, um, the best pizza places in New York. It talks about Ruby Rosa, Lombardi's, and so on. And then it injects some sentences. These places are known for the delicious and authentic pizzas, uh, and a few other things like Ruby Rosa offers a variety of thin crust pizzas. These are likely things that it knows. The LLM might know that because it was pre-trained on such a huge uh, data set that it may have figured these things out based on its training data, or it's just general trends that it learned from its training data that these are some of the kinds of things that are available in, in PIDs areas. But it's not backed up by the retrieved pieces of context. So this is super helpful because it's telling you, showing you where you don't have nice traceability of the final response back to individual pieces of retrieve context from the Yelp search. So, so those are some examples of both success, successfully grounded responses as well as ones where there are blind spots and made up stuff which are not grounded. And now we can look at, finally at answer relevance where it's an evaluation. Again, we are checking whether the final response is relevant to the question that was asked, and this turns out to be the case in this case. Um, over here, where there's a less clear answer, it gets a lower score uh, for, for Toronto. And, and, and as you experiment with these data agents, you can also do this kind of comparative view where with TrueLens, where you can look at different versions. So, Remember that we are trying out two different versions. One is just the OpenAI chat completion without access to the Yelp review. So this is just simple, simple chatbot. Whereas over here, we have access to the Yelp agent. And you can see that certain things, uh, these metrics can, can change, like the agreement with, with some source of ground truth goes up quite a bit as you go from the simple chat-based application to the one that makes use of agents. So I'm going to pause here. The next thing that we wanted to do was to start getting into the notebook itself to show you how this kind of agent can be built 
easily with the abstractions available in Llama Index and evaluated with, with True Lens. Um, let me switch over to that, and Jerry and I will tag team a little bit on this and walk you through walk you through this notebook. So Jerry, maybe you can kick things off with building the app, and then we can I can speak to the evaluations. Yep, that sounds great. You. Um, so uh, you know we're we're basically walking through the notebook of first building. Uh, a Llama index agent, a data agent, uh, and, and specifically in this use case, we're uh, building it over the Yelp tool. Um, so uh, a little bit kind of different from the original examples I shared where it was building like an agent over a static knowledge corpus, like a rag pipeline. Here, we're actually building it over an external API tool. And we'll walk through the process of how that works. Uh, of course, like, you, you know, we need to do the pip installs and install TrueLens eval, Llama index, Llama hub, Yelp API. Um, we'll see that the Yelp tool is actually found on Lava Hub, which I mentioned is our community-driven hub for just a variety of different integrations from agent tools to data loaders to templates. So the first thing you'll do is, um, as Anupam is showing, you know, from llamaindex.agent import OpenAI agent. Um, you know, that, that just imports the class. You want to make sure that your OpenAI API key is specified. Um, you'll also want a Yelp API key because we're actually going to be using this agent to interact with the Yelp API. Um, and we'll kind of walk through the process of how that works. The next step is here we're actually going to construct uh, the Yelp tool. Um, you'll see that it basically the statement is from llamahub.tools.yelp import Yelp tool spec. What exactly is a tool spec, you might ask? A tool spec is basically an API interface definition within Llama Index that's specifically designed for agent interactions. So um, it's written just you know like a standard Python class with uh, you know a class definition plus a bunch of functions. Each function can take in you know a set of arguments and pass back a response. Um, maybe the one difference is that you know you can't actually just load this class and call it manually, like call these functions manually, um, but What's more interesting is that you can we actually let you basically directly plug in these Python classes um, as tools right into an agent, so that instead of you manually calling a function, the agent can actually you know has the understanding of all the function signatures within the class and can actually call the different tools or functions within the class with the appropriate uh, 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 parameters um, and and get back the response. Uh, the response feeds back into the conversation history, and you can iterate from there. So here we designed a Yelp tool spec, which is a set of functions specifically around interacting with a Yelp API. Um, and um, you know we'll, we'll kind of go into the specific functions here in just a bit, but we initialize a Yelp tool spec. The other thing we're going to import is what we call uh, the load and search tool spec, which I covered briefly in a previous slide. But it's essentially a wrapper abstraction for helping you do on-the-fly indexing uh, for handling large responses. Um, so for instance, like the Yelp API, some calls, like if you, you know, look at all the reviews for a restaurant might return a lot of text data. Um, if you just uh, do the naive thing of stuffing all this text data into the context window for an agent's conversational memory, you might overflow the memory buffer. So what we do is we have some nice uh, convenience abstractions, which will basically take in any sort of data, uh, construct an index for it. And actually, the agent, instead of uh, ingesting all the data into its conversation memory, can actually do some sort of top case search and retrieval. Uh, and you can plug in uh, you know, uh, a llama index rag, a rag abstraction in there to try to find the most relevant results. So um, the next line, you know, we're, we're just going to uh, have a Gordon Ramsay prompt. Uh, you answer questions about restaurants and style Gordon Ramsay, often insulting the ass here. Um, that part is pretty straightforward. The step after is we construct the agent, um, <clears throat> OpenAI agent from tools. And this is where you see that we pass the Yelp tool spec. Um, uh, it, we convert it into a set of tools and wrap it with the load and search tool spec and pass that into the agent. Um, so and is there two tools, two tools here because there's a consumer and business separate interface or? Yeah, and I think you'll, you'll probably see the execution of 
what, what the tools are as, as you run through the app. But here, you know, in this API definition, there's a few tools and, and I think uh, it probably um, involves, I'm just going to speculate, like uh, listing like restaurants as well as uh, kind of being able to search over the reviews of the restaurant. Um, I, I think that's it. And, and we can verify that as we go down the notebook. Um, and then, and, and, and then the next section is to just, you know, set up uh, GPT 3.5 for, for um, kind of uh, comparison purposes. Uh, and I think uh, the next part is around instru instrumentation with uh, TrueLens so that you can actually set up some sort of eval scaffolding around the agent. Um, and that part, I'm going to pass it back to you, Anupam, to just uh, walk through a little bit about how that works. Yeah. So with TrueLens, you have similar set of things to, to import. There's this abstraction of a feedback function that I mentioned earlier in the slides. So that's the class you import here. We make use of OpenAI to do evaluations, but we can also work with other LLMs. In this particular notebook, we're using OpenAI. And there are a few other things here. And then there are some base uh, feedback functions that are available out of the box, which you also import, like groundedness and ground truth and so on. There's a database that you set this true object includes a database which logs the prompts responses intermediate results evaluations you reset that so that you're starting from scratch um, and then in this evaluation setup over here you're defining some of these new feedback functions like query translation query translation as i informally mentioned Earlier, question one is what the user asks. Question two is what the LLM agent translates it into to make it work for the tool, the Yelp tool in this case that it's working for. And then this LLM-based evaluation, which will make use of GPT 3.5 Turbo, is just given a very simple prompt to check, given these two questions, the original user question and the question that um, the LLM produced, to send to the Yelp API, how similar are they? And you gave it a review on a scale of, a rating on a scale of one to 10. There are a few other things here, which I'll not skip in the interest of time, but then you set up this query translation function to uh, make use of the user input, the prompt, the user query, and, and then you're also telling it <coughs> uh, where to get the, agent the llm agent translated query from so those are the two inputs that it works with so this is one way to set up these these feedback functions there are other feedback functions here available like the groundedness one that i mentioned question answer relevance or answer relevance and context relevance all of these are already available out of the box so you're here you're just setting up what the inputs are that it that these evaluations will work work with. So for context relevance, that's the original user query and the retrieved piece of information that comes back from the Yelp API call and so on. So once you have set these up, you also set up a ground truth eval. So there's a golden set here that we are setting up. These were the kinds of questions that we were walking you through the examples on the slides, like what's the best diner in Toronto? What's the best, where's the best pizza in New York and so on, Gumbo Social in San Francisco. Uh, we have set up a ground truth eval for this just as a baseline. Uh, and then we run the dashboard. When we run the dashboard, a streamlit dashboard pops up that looks a bit like this. So this has, uh, this has, keeps track of the number of records or prompts and responses that were processed. There are six in this set. Um, average latency, cost, uh, the, and then the various feedback functions. So you can see here that with the just the OpenAI chat completion, the ground truth eval is at 0.56, answer relevance 0.18, which is quite low. When you update, you augment it with the Yelp agent, the answer relevance goes up a lot. Over here, there aren't even any notions of groundedness or query translation or context relevance because we don't know how to provide traceability for just a, just an LLM-based, purely LLM-based application, whereas here you can 
uh, ground these things in the responses from the external source of truth here, which is the Yelp agent. So you get a bit of this leaderboard that lets you compare and pick the best version of the app. And then for individual bullet points, like individual records and queries, you can go deeper. So uh, if we go back to that best diner in Toronto question, uh, the leaderboard, if you drill down, you can get at e record level evaluations uh, for the relevant feedback functions. So on the what's the best diner in Toronto, this was the response from the OpenAI completion chat. Uh, the ground truth, on the other hand, is the George Street Diner. So on answer relevance, it got a it got a low score. If you look over here at the uh, same question, but for the Yelp agent, you can see that context relevance is fairly high. Uh, on the ground truth eval, it did poorly because it said White Lily Diner relative to George Street Diner but it's well grounded. It did come back from the Yelp review uh, that um, the best diner is White, White Lily Diner. Uh, and then for query translation, it did well. Answer relevance, it did well as well. So this gives you a quick tour. I know we are kind of getting at time here. We did want to spend a minute or two on best practices. So I just want to wrap up and leave you with this takeaway on the agent quad for evaluating LLM agents for hallucinations where it's very closely related to the RAG triad, but has this additional step of tool selection and checking, which includes evaluating that the right tool was selected and that the query was appropriately translated. And then we go into context relevance, groundedness, and answer relevance, which we just walked through. And we'll take a couple of minutes here to give you uh, some best practices for agents as you're building agents, some, some final best practices to keep in mind. So over to you, Jerry, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Sounds great. Um, yeah, some of these best practices are pretty intuitive. We wrote a blog post on this a few months ago um, and uh, are ever evolving or thinking on this. Uh, one is just writing like good tool prompts for your API interfaces uh, in terms of tools that you pass to the agents. Um, basically, a lot of uh, like GPT-4, for instance, uh, is probably the best model for, for interacting with some of these tools. But even that requires a bit of kind of prompt engineering to make sure that, you know, get this def function definition is clear enough so that I can actually call it. Um, you need to make sure the arguments are correctly specified and that it actually can kind of interpret how to actually um, you know, call these functions with the correct arguments. Uh, uh, one general principle is for given the kind of there, there's a certain um, error of like, you know, maybe these agents aren't super reliable right now. And so as a result, you do want to give them a little bit of handlebars. Uh, so make these tools tolerant of partial or faulty inputs. If the agent actually infers the wrong parameters or actually doesn't fill in the parameters it's supposed to, can you, for instance, actually, you know, uh, replace that with good defaults? Can you actually return a proper error message to the agent so that, you know, basically giving it a few shot example of a negative example so that it can actually correct itself in the next loop? Um, really designing the tool in a way so that it's friendly to use by agents that might not always use the tool correctly. This is maybe an aspect of API interface design that's a little different than kind of traditional API interface design for software engineering, where you're really trying to guide the agent into actually interacting with their services the right way. Um, uh, this also relates to some stuff around, you know, being able to return the right messages, uh, whether it's from errors like exception handling or from uh, like post requests. Like basically, if you actually modify state, can you actually return success or error um, to the agent so that it knows that it did the job correctly? Um, the last two, don't overload the agent with tools. Uh, we've mentioned this. If you have, if you basically give the agent more than like five or six tools, it starts getting confused um, and and might not be able to use the right ones correctly. Uh, another practice that we found to be pretty good, actually, is this idea of hierarchical agent modeling. Um, basically, um, having an agent, instead of calling just a tool, um, call another agent. So that basically, you have a network of agents. Each agent maybe has like access to three or four tools. Some of these tools might be other agents, too. And each agent is roughly specialized in its domain of executing a certain task. Um, this means that you don't actually overload a single agent with a bunch of tools. Uh, you just have uh, a network of different agents uh, that can, uh, for instance, orchestrate and communicate with each other. 
Um, these are all things that were basically uh, practices that were evolving, but that's basically a list for now. Great. With that, I think we'll wrap up and we'll open it up for questions. You can just check us out, check out our GitHubs. And uh, uh, we also have a Truera LLM observability watch list, which is uh, uh, a more scalable product that goes beyond the open source. And you're welcome to get on that watch list as well. We'll give early access to folks. Uh, and of course, Slama Index. And it's been great to work with Jerry and collaborate on both teaching the course and this working more closely with Llama Index and team on building and evaluating RAG-based applications and LLM agents. Uh, and we are excited to take final questions. This is a great time for our field. Perfect. Thanks for exploring. Well, thank you so much, Sherry and Anupam. I know our community really enjoyed everything that you taught us today. Uh, very interesting session. Uh, I've gathered some questions, I think, before we end today. I think we could get through a few. Uh, but the first question is, how can I create a chatbot that accurately answers complex scientific questions using the knowledge base? Exact phrasing and wording is paramount. Yeah, I can, I can take this. I was taking a look at this question on the Slido, and basically there's a bunch of different components you, you kind of have to think about. And so I can kind of list some of these components and it really depends on the nature of your data, your use case, as well as your performance requirements. Um, so one is what 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 is the kind of like parsing strategy for this data? Um, for instance, like are they archive papers with like embedded charts and tables? Um, are they kind of like, you know, web pages? Uh, are they basically structured data? Uh, it really depends on what the form factor of this like scientific knowledge base is. Um, I always recommend like start simple with like some basic parsing strategies before you try something more advanced. Uh, once you try something more advanced, you can take a look at our deep learning.ai course uh, or also the LAM index documentation as well. One co uh, comment about like scientific stuff in general is that sometimes people struggle with uh, if you're using like a default LLM, um, like especially if it's pre-trained on a bunch of data it might not actually understand specific kind of technical terms or concepts, right? Uh, this really is model dependent. And so if that is the case and you're locked into using that model, you might want to consider fine tuning as well. Um, and so basically just like actually fine tuning so that understands the overall like vocabulary that um, you're, um, that, uh, of the domain that you're operating in. Um, another piece is it really depends on kind of what types of questions you want to ask. Uh, are you asking like very analytical questions over structured data? Or are you asking kind of um, questions that span, uh, require understandings of charts and tables along with the text? Um, these all require like maybe slightly different strategies to play around with. Um, but you know, uh, in, in the end, the answer is relatively broad, but I would basically kind of think about all the dimensions from model selection to the data parsing ingestion to the retrieval strategy. Uh, and of course you need to uh, like basically every app needs to set up like some sort of eval scaffold. Yeah, and the RAG triad for evaluation could be particularly valuable there with groundedness being extremely important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Absolutely. I think for our next question, at what level of complexity does using agents make sense? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Uh, I think it kind of, uh, it, it definitely depends a little bit on your use case. I think if you're, for instance, a, a lot of enterprises, for instance, are building RAG. Um, and so if you're, for instance, interested in doing like search and retrieval, I'd probably start with some of the core RAG concepts first, um, basically doing like retrieval, uh, you know, and then synthesis using an LLM. So you start a little bit smaller. Um, and what we typically see is that uh, companies and, and developers start wanting to add agentic behavior on top of their RAG pipelines once they want to handle kind of more complex questions or once they start wanting to interact with services. But I would typically think about it like start small, um, if, especially if you're doing RAG, build like a basic RAG pipeline first, then add the agentic stuff on top. If on the mm -hmm. other hand, you just directly want to build something that interacts with the API service, you basically need to build an agent. And so that like, for instance, if you want to build something that interacts with a RAG uh, Yelp API that Anupam just showed, then you, you should just start there. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Do we have time for one last, uh, Diana? I think one more, and then we definitely have to end. Um, how do you think companies will look to apply standard MLOps principles to LM and GPTs? Yeah, I, I think I can kick that off. 
uh, and then Jerry, feel free to add. I think, for example, on the observability side, there's a lot of overlap. So if you think about the MLOps platforms, observability is increasingly recognized as an important component of it. And by that, I mean full lifecycle observability. So during development, testing, and debugging, and then once the model is in production, continue to monitor it and then circle back and debug if there's a problem. And that carries over from traditional LLM, uh, traditional machine learning models to large language models and generative AI. Uh, the differences are in how you do the evaluation, which is kind of where we, what we focused on quite a bit today. Um, but the core components of the platform around tracking things over time, monitoring over time, and so on. So there's a lot of shared infrastructure, but there's also technical differences in how you do evaluations, how you scale up those evaluations into production workloads, which might go into millions or tens of millions. Uh, but there's a lot of overlap there. And then on the development side, there are some significant differences that maybe Jerry can talk to or... No, I mean, I think... Um... It's, it's mostly what you said, like besides kind of like training a model, um, you're not really a training model for, for the, the usage of this, but you still need to set up some basic metrics because you're trying to evaluate like a black box stochastic system. Um, and so definitely have some number, some data set that makes sense and try out some of the advanced techniques. Perfect. Well, Jerry Adam Palm, thank you so much for speaking to our community today. I know we learned a lot. We will send the slides and the notebook out afterwards. Um, and we hope to see you all again very soon. We've also dropped a survey in the link as well. Uh, so please fill it out. In 2024, we're going to have a lot of different events. And so we'd love to hear your feedback on how to improve everything. But thanks again for coming, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.